can be opened into Matthew chapter 16. Let's we'll start with a familiar verse. That song, My Savior's Love, one time of the Calvary Low Down, is told me of one of his favorite songs. He came to preach for us one time. There's not a lot better than we can sing it about. Amen. Matthew chapter 16, I'd like to look at uh, verse number 18. For so I'm sure we all are familiar with this particular passage of Scripture. The a few verses before. Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? And he asked them, who do you say that I am? It's when Peter gave the, the proclamation that he was the Son of God, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And in verse 18, after telling him that flesh and blood had not revealed this to him, Christ goes on to say, And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. I'd like us to look at what is the church. Mm -hmm. I know I'm probably preaching to the choir as the saying goes, but there's a whole lot of misunderstandings about what is the church. Right. Mm -hmm. like I said, I've never taught or preached on this particular topic, so you might have to bear with me a little bit. I hope I can make sense of it to you all. But here we, Christ gives this decree that. Thou art here, and upon this rock I will build my church. Mm -hmm. well, the Catholics say, well, that Peter is the rock that Christ is referring to. Mm -hmm. But just a simple study of word will show you that that's not the case. Amen. Peter means a, a little stone. And Amen. This rock is a big rock, a big stone. It mm -hmm. really refers back to Christ himself, I believe. Mm -hmm. Amen. It's upon him that the church is built. Him being the chief cornerstone, Paul says. Amen. Yes, the, the apostles were the, the next layer, if you will. But Peter was not the one who Christ found the church upon. Mm -hmm. It was Christ himself. You know, we see it also didn't happen at Pentecost, as many would say. Right. We don't have to turn all these places, but Luke chapter 24, verse 49, Christ told his disciples right before he ascended to heaven to, to tarry in Jerusalem until they were renewed with power. And then we see that in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came down with a mighty rushing wind. And Amen. Yeah. It, it said that they were, it was as fire upon them. And they spake in tongues, and those were known tongues. Everyone heard this. In their own tongue, it's a bad passage. Well, they weren't speaking gibberish like the Pentecostals do. Exactly. But that was not when the church was founded. It was, Christ says here that he was going to build it upon himself. My thinking is that the, when they were renewed with power from on high there in Acts chapter 2, that was just God's confirmation of the church, just as he did with the temple in Solomon's day. Mm -hmm. We can turn back there real quick, Second Chronicles chapter 7. Second Chronicles chapter 7. After Solomon had built the temple and it was finished, and he prayed, blessings upon it and beginning in verse number one of second chronicles seven it says now when solomon had made an end of praying the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the lord filled the house amen and the priest could not enter the house of the lord because the glory of the lord had filled the lord's house and when all the children of israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the lord upon the house they bowed themselves with the their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worship and praise the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Here we see this was God's confirmation, if you will, upon 
temple that Solomon built. Mm -hmm. <coughs> turn now and read that account of Acts, and we'll see the likeness of God's confirmation upon the church which Christ had already built. <coughs> Acts chapter 2, first eight verses, this is the whole account here. It says that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were, speaking of the 12 apostles after Matthias was added, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven of, of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them clothes and tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in their, his own language. Mm -hmm. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? Amen. So we see much like when God confirmed the temple here, and, and excuse me, on the day of Pentecost, He confirmed the church. The temple had already been built, and just like in this instance, the church had already been built by Christ. Mm -hmm. The church is not the building. The church is not a certain denomination, such as the Catholic Church or the Methodist Church, and the church is not universal and invisible, and that's. Well, the most common teaching today that many today would say that the church of the God is all the same and you won't find that in the scripture either. Amen. When Christ founded his church, he took baptized believers, but he didn't take all of them, did he? He just had the twelve. Right. But there were certainly many others that believed on him, Mary, Martha, Lazarus. We know those three by name. There was the, the other women as well. We know Zacchaeus. And apparently at some point, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea seemed to have believed as well. Right. Yet none of them were ever in the group that Christ found the church out of. And back in our text in Matthew 16, he was speaking to the 12 disciples. Mm -hmm. And then when he gives the Great Commission in Luke 28, he's speaking to, or not, excuse me, Matthew 28, he's speaking to the 11, the 12 minus Judas. Well, the command to baptize was given to his church. The command to preach the gospel was given to his church. And I think some time we, as you know, good sovereign grace Baptist, don't think a lot about the church and what it is and what it means. Right. So we could spend quite a whole other lesson on the, the function and the purpose of the church, but I'd like to just consider what is the church. Mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of this debate, if you will, about the name church, or the, or the word church. So I'm no Greek scholar, but the word church originated from a Greek word called kyriakos, or kyriakos doma is what the early disciples used to call the Lord's church, and it just means the Lord's house. Mm -hmm. That word kyriakos means of the Lord, belong to the Lord. We see it when Paul uses it when he says the Lord's supper, and when John says he was in the spirit of the Lord's day. Hey, Matt, that's the same. And then, 1 Timothy chapter 3, we can turn over there. Paul calls the church the house of God. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Verses 14 and 15, after he gives qualifications of the bishop and of a deacon and he gives other commandments regarding how to conduct 
ourselves. And verse 14, it says, These things write unto you, hoping, or write unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Amen. The house of God we, is another is a term Paul here uses to describe the church, but it doesn't necessarily mean the the building. Mm -hmm. Well, like I said, it was a term that the early church often used to describe the church because they didn't have the word church at that time. But they we'll get to the, the other Greek word there in a moment, but between. Through translations and transliterations, we end up with the word church. Mm -hmm. I found it interesting in Scotland, they still use the, the older form, of, which is Kirk. Mm -hmm. That was one of the words that made its way into the English, and then eventually we end up with the word church. Mm -hmm. It just means it belongs to the Lord. Amen. There's no when you say the word church, you're not confusing it with the synagogues or with the temple or with the whatever the Muslims call their building, the mosque. Mm -hmm. But I know some people don't like the word church because it's not a direct translation of the Greek word, which is ekklesia, which is what the right. New Testament uses most of the time, which means a congregation or assembly or to be mm -hmm. called out. In Greek politics in that day, of the people would be called out into a public assembly for political discussions, and that's the type of assembly that he's speaking of here—a local assembly of people. Mm -hmm. And that's why the church cannot be <coughs> universal and invisible, because it, it literally means it's a local, visible body of people. But we are a congregation of people here, a congregation of believers. Amen. That's why if we meet down at Adam's house, as we've done before when they used to live down here, we were still very much New Testament Baptist Church. Amen. Amen. It doesn't matter where the church meets. It, doesn't. it is the congregation or the, the assembly that is the church. Amen. It is not the building. It's not necessarily the place of worship which determines the church. We see all throughout the scriptures of examples of this. Of we, we all turn here with 1 Corinthians 1 2. Paul addresses that letter to the church, which is at Corinth. That doesn't sound very universal to me, does it? Amen. Well, there's a church at Corinth, just as there's. Again, in Galatians 1 2, he addresses a letter to the churches of Galatia. Mm -hmm. There was more than one church there. We have the church at Thessalonica, the church at Antioch, the church of Jerusalem. 36 times in scriptures will receive a plural form churches. Mm -hmm. this each, each time it is a local congregation of people. Right. In fact, Christ himself in Revelation, when he addresses each of the seven churches, he says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Mm -hmm. So, yes, churches, plural, means there's more than one. It's not just one big church that we're all a member of. Paul, in the Corinthian letter, likens a church unto a body. We have a head, which is Christ, and we are each members in particular. Amen. But if we were all one big universal church, it would be, we might be the foot, but we would we'd be able to operate without the rest of the body, would we? Amen. So you run into a lot of problems when you embrace universal church thinking. Right. But the world. Usually those who subscribe to those type of teachings, they say, well, doesn't the Bible sometimes say the church? And yes, it does use that in the 
you might call it institutional or an abstract use of the word church, just like our, our text here when Christ said, I will build my church. But we will also use that in such ways, such as you might say the Masonic law. You're not speaking about anyone in particular, but you're not. Doesn't mean they're all one lodge. Right. You might say the public school, and you're talking about them in general, but not one in particular school. Right. <clears throat> Such as, if you ever watch a wildlife documentary, they're describing animals, they always talk real quietly for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> the, the lion, let's say like lion, he's the, he's the fiercest in the kingdom, or something like that. They're not speaking about one particular lion, but using it in general, generalized lions. And that's how sometimes the scriptures use the word or the phrase of the church. Just as we saw in our text and as in 1 Timothy, that is the church of the living God. Just we are the church of the living God just as much as some of you are faith in Clarksville. But we're not all one church of the living God. Right. Well, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, and well as Philippians 3, 16, Paul tells that he persecuted the church before his conversion. He didn't persecute just one singular church. He persecuted many, as we know, mm -hmm. he was on his way to Damascus to persecute more when the Lord saved him. So that's 1 Corinthians 15, 9. 1 Corinthians 12, 28, he says he set some in the church first, apostles. Amen. That doesn't mean that all churches started with apostles, but the church in general started with apostles, and then on to you know, also been some prophets, and eventually we're to preachers and teachers today. Mm -hmm. Ephesians three twenty one, he says, "Unto him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ." It means each church is to bring glory to God. Well, we might, I don't want to pick on any other church, but at least some of you since they're the closest, they might be doing something that's not glorifying to God. And if we are, or vice versa, that doesn't mean the church is not bringing glory to God, but our church is, and they're not. Amen. Over in chapter 5 of Ephesians, he likens the relationship of a husband and wife and the Christ and the church. As church subject in Christ, so let the wives be subject unto their husbands, and as the husbands love their wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So that doesn't mean that he gave himself for one church and not the other, or he did give himself for all his churches in general. Amen. But the use of the phrase the church is in Meaning, it has to be universal and invisible. We can use it in a generic sense, if you will, to speak of all the churches of God. Right. So the simple meaning of the word church in the Greek tells us that it had to be a local assembly of people. Also, another common heresy, especially among Catholics and their daughters is that the church equals salvation. <laughs> right. In fact, even the reformers wrote that there is no salvation outside of the Roman Catholic Church. Mm. Okay. But you will not find anywhere in Scripture where the church is equated to salvation. Right. Like it's only found in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, according to Acts chapter 4. If there is no other name given in heaven whereby we must be saved. Amen. Well, certainly the church is given the responsibility to preach and to baptize, but salvation is not confined to any particular church, if you will. When joining a particular church doesn't make one saved either. So those who Christ chose to start his church with were already professing baptized believers. Mm -hmm. Yet, the 
the Catholics especially are bad about saying you have to join their church to right. be saved. You can join whatever church you want to. If you never believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you've never been truly born again. Amen. The, the Catholic Church and Pope, they can't save you. The Methodist Church can't save even a good sound Baptist Church in and of itself. You know, Amen. Save. You're right. The, I know there's a lot of people who equate going to church with being saved. And, we sometimes use that phrase a little loosely too. But to go to church means to come down to the place where God's people are assembled. Mm -hmm. But just quote going to church doesn't equate salvation either. It doesn't Amen. score your points with God. But that's how many people view it. Mm -hmm. I did my good do my good deed. I went to church. Well, they think, well, if I go to church enough, God will be pleased with me. But the purpose of the church is to worship God. It's Amen. Not, so we won't get off on the purpose of the church too much, but it's not to be a social gathering. It's not to be necessarily a way of salvation. Certainly people can be saved during church services, but... The church itself is not the way of salvation. That is only Amen. for Christ. Well, the church is not meant for entertainment. The church or the, the assembling of God's people together, it's meant for worshiping God. Mm -hmm. You see it all the way throughout the Old Testament. That's how the Israelites worshiped. They gathered together and worshiped God. And certainly, there were signs of individual worship, but by and large, God was worshiped corporately. Mm -hmm. This is we must come together and worship him as a body. And that is what it means to be a church or the church. Not just because we have this building here and have a name on it that says church. Not that because we call ourselves Christians, but do we follow the example that's placed in scripture? Mm -hmm. Christ said he will build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So the church never went extinct or it might have went underground or very unnoticed for a while. But it didn't have to be revived or reformed or anything like that. Amen. It's always been in existence from the time of Christ until now. Also, we can't say that all the saved are necessarily members of the Lord's church. Right. As much as we would like them to be, but it said never anywhere in Scripture do we equate being saved as being a member of the Lord's church. Amen. We always see people professing Christ and shortly after being baptized scripturally, but then it said the Lord added in the church daily as such as should be saved in the book of Acts. But with all the counterfeit churches today, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what the church is. You bad. Said so you, you have to really stretch any sort of meaning of the word church to come up with some universal, invisible church. Sure. Amen. So, and if you look, even if you look it up in the dictionary, the very first definition you'll see is a. That's the building that we meet in. I think it's about the third definition down where you find a local assembly. Mm. But that is what the church is biblically. Amen. God's local assemblies throughout the world. He said there's the, the church at Rome, the church at Corinth, the church at yeah. Thessalonica, the righteous of Galatia, all the seven different churches in Asia Minor. And yes, we can use the church collectively to describe all churches in general, but there is no such thing as just this one church that we're all members of. One day we will be, when we get to heaven, we'll be all part of the church of the firstborn, Hebrews describes it. 
I'll go ahead and write that down in notes. See if I can find a real quick for this. Hebrews. I forgot what chapter it's in here. going to so, anyway, he describes that in heaven will be the, the general assembly and the church of the firstborn. Mm -hmm. At any time, we'll, we'll all be gathered together in one congregation, one assembly, and then we can be the one universal church, if you will. But until then, God's churches are individual congregations throughout the world. Amen. And you can be sure until the Lord calls out of here. His church will never cease. There may be a small number, there may be few and far between, but the Lord's churches will always be here until he returns. Amen. Otherwise, his promise that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it will be made null and void. I know Satan would love to stomp it out. Satan would love to right. have us quieted and stifled and the world would as well we have God's promises that nothing shall prevail against his church amen so it doesn't mean that we won't be small in number it doesn't mean that we won't be illegal just like it was in the days of the apostles it doesn't mean right. that it will always be easy going with, with God before us who can be against us amen let's hold it up though